Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Ukraine House. We're thrilled that you're here. And we are looking forward to a substantive next hour. It is my honor, on behalf of the Ukraine House Organizing Committee, to introduce the moderator of our next panel, Ms. Natalie Oresko. She was Minister of Finance of Ukraine from 2014 to 16. She is chairperson of Aspen Institute Kiev, and she's also a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council in Washington, DC. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Yudesko. Thank you very much, Alexa. Well, I wanna thank all of you for joining me today in what is the penultimate panel. It's entitled Mobilizing Capital to Rebuild restore, renew, and revitalize Ukraine. I I've been so impressed over the last few days uh, with the level of interest that I've heard and I've seen here at the WEF on this subject in particular. And as we enter into the fourth month of this war, today is day 90, Ukrainians and the world that supports Ukraine in this illegal and unprovoked Russian war against the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian nation are thinking not only about how to ensure Ukraine wins this war as soon as reasonably possible, but also how to invest and contribute to rebuilding a country that Russia is attempting to destroy in its entirety. I'll just share a little. Over four years ago, I started some work in Puerto Rico. It's been my home for the last few years. And Puerto Rico was hit by a devastating hurricane. Lasted almost a full day, 24 hours, and the speed of the winds were unbelievable, historic. That one day of devastation, one day, on an island 1 66th the size of Ukraine, cost damage of about $100 billion. And in contrast, Ukraine has been devastated for 90 days by thousands of missiles, destroying over 33 million square meters of housing stock, hundreds of buildings, educational institutions, healthcare facilities, cultural and religious buildings, some 300 bridges, 90,000 cars. And this estimate I've just given you from the Kiev School of Economics is actually a couple weeks old. So the destruction continues and it's more than what I described. It's important that these estimates of damage are also being collected in real time in Ukraine. There's an organization or a group called Russia Will Pay. And on the website, damaged.in.ua, citizens can submit documentation of the damages directly. To begin, we can start thinking about looking at what the estimate of the Center for Economics and Business Research, CEBR, one of the leading UK economic consultancies did when they did an independent report looking at the total losses from the first six years of this horrific war in Donbass and Crimea alone. And their estimate for 2014 to 2020 was about 280 billion US dollars. And that included capital losses of about 117 billion. That's just the first six years of this war in just two regions of Ukraine. More recently, the Kiev School of Economics has estimated total losses at this stage of Russia's terrorism in Ukraine at some $600 billion, including GDP decline, investment cessation, and capital losses. Until Ukraine prevails and this destruction stops, until the war ends, we know the amount of the losses will grow each day. So it is a particular honor to be able to introduce you to my panel today, because I don't believe there is anyone better in the world to discuss mobilizing capital, the capital that will be required for this historic objective than our guests here today. I'm gonna take a minute to just describe a little bit of the background of each of them, and then I'm gonna ask them to do some opening statements. So first, we are honored to have with us today Prime Minister of Ukraine, Denis Shmihal. Prime Minister Shmihal was appointed March, was 
appointed by the Verkhovna Rada, the Parliament of Ukraine, March 4th of 2020, and now presides over what may be the most difficult situation in Ukraine's recent history, not just economic, not just financial, but humanitarian, military, everything that could be imagined in terms of a challenge for a prime minister he's facing today. He has experience in business, including the energy sector. He comes with experience in both local government and previous to the, his position as prime minister, also the central government. So he brings a broad set of experiences and knowledge. Um, I'm going to, we are, we're missing one member of our panel who's on her way, but I'm, I'm, I will in, introduce her now just so that we know who we're talking with. And that is the EBRD's president, Odile Renaud Basso. She is the seventh president of the EBRD, and she has been the president since November 2nd of 2020. She, in her previous role as director general in the French Treasury, dealt with everything from France's economic policies to their financial regulations, trade policies, debt management. Uh, she also had a wide variety of interactions and roles with the G7, the G20, the international financial institutions, and also, and I'm sorry she's not here to hear this, also attended the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, just like I did, so we're co-alumni. <laughs> so thank you. When she gets here, we'll clap for her. Here to my right, um, and it is my honor to introduce IFC, the International Finance Corporation's Managing Director and Executive Vice President, Mahtar Job. He comes to this position just recently as of March 1st, 2021, because he knew we needed him. Um, <laughs> prior to this, he was the World Bank's Vice President for Infrastructure. And there he led the global efforts to build sustainable infrastructure in developing and emerging economies. I'm not sure that anyone has the breadth of experience that he does, particularly in this area, with critical work in energy, transportation, digital infrastructure, public-private partnerships. He spent six years at the World Bank as Vice President for Africa and was a passionate advocate there for clean and affordable electricity. These are all issues that we're going to need to take into account as we rebuild our country. He has a firm grasp and has worked very closely to ensure that the public-private partnership, that interface between those two sectors, is most efficient and effective. And he has had a very, very strong role as the former Minister of Economy and Finance of Senegal, doing this directly, as I say, directly on the ground in the, chair, in, in the cat seat, building a foundation for Senegal's growth. So he's been through all this. Again, thank you. Maktar. And last but not least, from the hosts of our Davos World Economic Forum, I'm proud to have with us Swiss Investment Fund for Emerging Markets, or CFEM's Chairman of the Board, Dr. Jörg Frieden. We don't even have enough time to go through your biography, Dr. Frieden, because you have such enormously broad experience in the Swiss government. You have worked uh, in an, a variety of positions as coordinator in Mozambique, as advisor for the World Bank in Washington, head of the Eastern and Southern Africa section in Bern, uh, in the Federal Office for Refugees. So, th so again, we are, we're bringing to you someone with a wealth of experience, and we are very grateful for you being here with us today. The most important part of mobilizing capital is having a vision of what is needed and how capital will be utilized. That vision can and will be critical to mobilizing donors and private investors. Most important, we'll start with this, is what does Ukraine want? How does Ukraine and how do Ukrainians want to seize this opportunity? Prime Minister Shmihal, would you please share your vision with us? Good afternoon, Natalia. Good afternoon, dear guests of the Ukrainian House in Davos, dear friends of Ukraine. On February 24, when the first missiles were striking Ukrainian cities, and many in Europe and around the world were convinced that the course of this war was already decided, that the Ukrainian troops will not be able to stand the assault of the world's second largest army that the Ukrainian public institutions will fall apart. We heard that banking, energy, and digital infrastructure were doomed 
and would not last even a week. All those predictions happily were wrong. The president of Ukraine, the government, and the Ukrainian parliament, as well as local governments, have been working seamlessly from day one, all in their places doing everything for our victory. Ukraine's energy system is stable. During the war, we managed to connect to the European power grid, and so we. At the beginning of the invasion, Ukraine's economy and business virtually came to a halt. The rapid and radical steps by the government in the tax, regulatory, and financial domains have allowed a significant number of companies to resume their operations quite fast. Ukraine and Ukrainians, led by Volodymyr Zelensky, mobilized the whole world to support our state. Military and financial assistance to Ukraine from our allies, as well as prompt sanctions against Russia, have finally turned the scales in favor of our nation. Today, Ukraine is confident of its victory. That is why it is very important now to think together about how we plan to recover Ukraine and how we want to see our state in the future. The topic of the today's discussion is mobilizing capital to rebuild, restore, renew, and revitalize Ukraine. These four words are supposedly synonymous, but each of them has its own meaning behind and reflects each of the stages we need to go through for Ukraine's new European future. The first one is to rebuild. Due to the Russia's war against Ukraine, more than 200 factories and large enterprises, 12 civilian airports, and more than a thousand educational institutions were damaged, destroyed, or seized. As a result of hostilities, almost 300 bridges and overpasses, about 25,000 kilometers of roads, and 40 million square meters of housing stock were damaged, destroyed, or seized, much more than in the reports that Natalia Jereska has just alluded to. We need to rebuild all this as soon as possible. Those damages are growing every day. Ukraine wants to apply a rather unique synthesis of approaches to rebuilding. The first one is the regional approach. When allied countries, sister cities, and transnational corporations take patronage over the Ukrainian regions and help them rebuild. They help with grants, expertise, and investment. The second approach is parametric. It is much more centralized, designed by the National Recovery Council, and will focus on the development of new standards in various areas of public life. Build Back Better is in the heart of this approach. This is, for example, the development of housing according to new standards, the restoration of iron and steel facilities using cutting edge green technology, or public buildings based on the principles of energy efficiency, barrier free environment, and innovation. Undoubtedly, all this has to be focused on safety and security because the war has made the security issue very acute. This formula will attract as many actors as possible to the implementation of uh, reconstruction projects and will continue to better transparency of the entire process. The second word is to restore. According to our government estimates, the total losses of Ukraine, Ukraine's economy due to the war, including both direct and indirect, have already reached 600 billion US dollars. That's the same data that was shared by the Kiev School of Economics. We invite our friends and partners to join the restoration by replenishing the recovery fund already established in Ukraine. It includes five sources of funding from private contributions, aid from companies and corporate organizations, aid from partner countries and international financial institutions, as well as aid from humanitarian organizations. But most importantly, the confiscated Russian assets. We call on all those who want and are ready to help Ukraine to use the United 24 platform to contribute to our victory. But even more, we call on our partners to confiscate Russian assets and use the funds to rebuild Ukraine. The third word is to renew. In our opinion, the basis for the country's renewal will be the national security, European integration, and economic transformation. The first and foremost factor will be the uh, Ukraine's national security. For this, we want 
to reinforce and improve our defense sector, establish long-term partnerships with countries who will be uh, reinforcing our dis defense sector. The key, the second key factor that will support Ukraine is the, the European integration. For Ukraine, these are open export markets, access to the European Union's structural funds, and finally, the long-awaited reunification with the European peoples, with whom we have much more in common than with our eastern neighbor. The third factor is that Ukraine aims to achieve breakthrough economic growth, including we plan to focus on the development of priority sectors of our economy. This is the development of the defense and airspace industry. The, the objective is not only to provide the Ukrainian armed forces with the most advanced weaponry, but also to become, um, to let it become one of the global leaders in its experts. Two additional sectors will receive additional incentives from the state. These are iron and steel and agri-food. The most important thing that Ukraine will rely on developing deep processing capabilities in both metallurgy and agriculture. New investment into these sectors will enjoy great support from the state. And we're going to be looking at the global international trends like sustainable development, green transformation, and digitalization. We believe those will be very powerful drivers for Ukraine's economic growth. Dear partners and friends, history knows many examples when after great wars, countries were reborn from the ashes and became much richer and economically stronger. One of the decisive factors for such success was reliable allies who were ready to help in various aspects. Today, Ukraine has the right partners and friends in different parts of the world, not only among government officials, but also among businesses and ordinary citizens. The example of the Ukraine's courage has demonstrated to the whole world what a genuine Ukraine is. Therefore, we're confident that on our way to victory, Ukraine's partners will continue to be with us. Since prosperous and developed Ukraine will be a great contribution to a prosperous new Europe. Thank you for your support. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you for our future development. Glory be to Ukraine. Thank you. Glory be to the heroes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. And I want to welcome once again, we, we, we did a short introduction so everyone knows your background, but I would like to personally welcome EVRD President Odile Renaud Basso. Thank you again for joining us. And I'd like to, please. So President Odile, could you tell us just in two minutes, general terms, how do you envision your institution's involvement and role? The EBRD has been is the largest single investor in Ukraine. And its role in Ukraine's economic development can't be overestimated. What can we look forward to in your work going forward in mobilizing capital to rebuild Ukraine? So thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I mean, it's amazing to see such a packed meeting room and uh, um, such a strong interest and commitment, I think, to Ukraine. What happened in Ukraine, what is happening, is has been a real shock for the bank, because as you, you mentioned, we are a very large first institutional investor. We had a lot of staff in Ukraine who would be very much involved in the financing, but also in the reform agenda uh, uh, of the country in the last few years. So we took very um, rapid measure also in order to react towards Russia. You know, Russia was a, a country of operation of the bank. We suspended any new operations to, to 2014, but we took a formal decision to suspend any access to EBRD resources to Russia and Belarus in a few weeks um, immediately after the uh, invasion. And I think that was a, an important step. It was, a, I mean, support. We got support from the governors, which was very important. Um, I think when thinking about the reconstruction, what is also very important is to think what we can do now. Because I think the better, I mean, it's still a war, fighting is still going on, I mean, but the economy is still running, the government is still functioning. And um, I think the more we can provide support now to keep 
the government, the institution functioning to, um, to keep the economy running, um, to support the private sector who is still continuing to deliver, to trade, to uh, um, do the sewing campaign and so forth, the better it will be, I mean, the better will be in b better position for the reconstruction. So that's why we've been, um, our intention is to continue to invest. We, to do that, of course, for a bank like us, it's a risk. Huh? So it's something like rating agencies do not really like, huh? or they are very worried of to seeing us doing that. So I think that we are getting some support from donors and uh, shareholders to guarantee to share the risk with us. And um, it's amazing to see um, the mobilization of the financial international institution, I mean, community, uh, to get some support uh, from the EU, from the US, from donors to help us in this endeavor. And uh, our intention in the show is to continue to invest 1 billion uh, this year. Um, and we have a very strong pipeline. And our focus is to support key infrastructure, such as electricity network, railway, um, nafta gas, uh, with, with a credit line to give them working capital and liquidity support. We repurpose some investment plan to give some uh, liquidity support to these companies, but also the private sector through credit lines to do for the agribusiness, for the pharmaceutical, and so forth. And we also plan to work with municipalities to help with um, this internally displaced person. So this is the what we are working on in the very short term. Of course, this is not the reconstruction. And when we come to the reconstruction, I think that we are extremely committed to do our best to contribute to this reconstruction with our role, which is, I mean, supporting the private sector, key infrastructure, and bringing in new investors. I was just an, a bit late because I were meeting with CEOs um, uh, that are, I mean, from worldwide, interested in thinking about Ukraine and what they can bring in the um, reconstruction phase. And I think that um, there will be a lot of interest in because the country has a huge potential. And I think when in the reconstruction, then the potential will, will be um, uh, enhanced. And the capacity to deploy new technology, innovation, the best standards uh, will be uh, extremely um, attractive and important. And institutions like us can help in attracting investment, supporting them, co-financing, um, uh, developing projects, uh, and so forth. So that's what we intend to do. I think we, are, we will work with other financial institutions, each in our role, very clearly with IFC, which is our uh, very important partners, but also um, all other players. And I think from our perspective, very strong coordination from donors will be very important. From IFIs, I don't think that we need to create a new institution, but we need to work together and to ensure that we are delivering the best for the country in the most efficient way. And that's why the EU initiative, for example, to create a platform is one very important instrument so as to get a sort of common roadmap together with the Ukrainian um, authorities because ownership will be uh, very important. And I think that the lead already taken by the authorities to define what are the objective and the way forward and to keep the uh, country's uh, governance also well in place in order to deliver in the most efficient manner will be extremely important. This should go hand in hand with reform, but I know, I mean, this is uh, to improve, to attract investment, rule of law, transparency, and so forth. This will be very important elements to build trust and confidence in the new uh, Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, as I mentioned earlier, Mahtar, your experience in leading the World Bank's sustainable infrastructure efforts provides a wealth of experience that we need for our vision of a revitalized Ukraine. Can you tell us how IFC might play a role and how you'll help us ensure that our new infrastructure is sustainable? No, thank you very much. And I would like to, to, to greet the Prime Minister and thank him for his visit in Washington. We had a very rich uh, discussion and uh, we were, uh, for those who don't know, uh, the oh, Prime Minister gosh. led the delegation in Washington to our, our sp uh, spring meeting and talked to the board and the partners. Odile was in the meeting, I was there, and we were all very impressed by the clarity of the vision. And also we had a, a meeting uh, uh, of 40 minutes uh, following that where we discussed a little more in detail what IFC can do 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister, for granting of your time during the, 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 your visit. I would also like to say hello to former colleague uh, Jürgen, and uh, for uh, also who has been uh, very much uh, uh, pushing this agenda. What we are, uh, IFC uh, and the World Bank Group are here to stand, and we will be helping, and we are helping Ukraine. That's my first message: is that we are here. We continue dispersing in the middle of the, of the war. And what I would like to say is uh, I was so impressed with the resilience of the private sector in Ukraine. You will be surprised to see that there is no default in payment of any credit that they had. And it's something that for, for us was quite uh, impressive and to see, to, to see how, in spite of the difficult situation, the private sector was able to function, to continue deliver, and to co continue deliver services. So first lesson, the private sector and the country are resilient. And this resiliency is the first strength of the country. Secondly, what we learn also is that we need to do something to, uh, 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 right now. We were uh, disbursing our loans to companies in the food, in the food sector. It was important. There were companies which were producing pork meat that needed to have a quick disbursement. We didn't hesitate to disburse. And the same with, uh, with, uh, with Odile. And one of the first lessons that we learned in all these situation of conflict after reconstruction is we need to coordinate. Often, this is the, the problem start with uh, people want to help, partner want to help, everybody come with his own ideas, his own vision, uh, and uh, sometimes it's not exactly what makes things move faster. So what is very clear and the commitment that I've seen this time is a willingness to work together and to coordinate. Uh, Odile and I talk regularly, our vice president on Europe work, talks basically daily. When there is a project that because we are co-financing all the time, we are ensuring that we have the same approach because we don't want to confuse already a situation which is complex. So second lesson needs to, for, for coordination for, from donors. So uh, third, move fast. The World Bank Group moved with 4.5 billion uh, 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 during, during the war and already 1.2 billion have been disbursed. That is not enough, we know, but uh, the needs are important, but being able to be nimble, to move fast, to be able to react quickly is a, is a key. And that was a, the important message that we hear from the Prime Minister when he came. He said, yeah, every day I need to be able to pay civil servants, to pay, to pay to be able to make the, 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 the economy run. If I don't have these resources and they're delayed, the cost is much higher for us. So speed is also very important. So what was the IC work before the war? So a lot of our work with, uh, with uh, Ukraine was around uh, climate change, greening the, the, the economy, and ensuring that uh, the energy content of the production in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine goes down, because it's very uh, energy intensive, as you know, and it was not necessarily an energy which was clean. So we have worked a lot with companies, with the banking sector, to green the, 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 the economy, but also to help on the, on the, on the agriculture sector and the food production. So we will continue doing more of that. And the complementarity is, is quite interesting. You uh, Odile emphasized the efforts of infrastructure. We will be focusing more on, uh, on, on the productive sector, and we will use the, 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 the strengths of each of our institutions to be able to cover the spectrum of needs we have. Lessons that we have in re reconstruction is that this combination of bottom-up and uh, top-down approaches. We, the planification, uh, planning for the reconstruction, we include very clear vision, and I think the Prime Minister has, has uh, uh, mentioned it, but also ensure that we have a, a, a good consultation process because the implementation will be, have to be fast and done in, in, on, on, on the ground. Take lesson also of things which, which work ve ve very well. Ukraine, the IT system, just uh, in no time uh, uh, developed and became, became one of the leading uh, sector in the world. And I think that what makes the IT system work in, uh, in, in Ukraine should be used and replicated in, uh, in, other, in, in other sectors. And part of it was being a system nimble with a very little uh, uh, reg uh, regulation, very simple, uh, given and uh, the, the ability to use the very rich human capital that exists in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. Lastly, take best practice and leapfrog. I think it would be the time to leapfrog 
on uh, using the technology, but also using the new policies and new things that are happening. And that's things that uh, we, can, uh, we can help by bringing the international experience that we have. And I think that that combination of leapfrogging and using the new technology in a country which has such a strong human capital will be able to, to accelerate the, the, the reconstruction. It will not be easy, you all know that. But I think uh, maintaining the, the private sector now by doing their trade financing, allowing them to be able to export uh, uh, in this uh, situation, but also to import the main input would be an essential part to uh, fill that gap. I will stop here uh, because I know that uh, you have a lot to, to contribute. But uh, the first, I would like really to hold us accountable because we are very committed in working really like, uh, like uh, twin brothers and sisters and, uh, uh, and to really come to you as one because it will be uh, the, 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 uh, the big lesson from what people have been doing in a post-conflict situation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Frieden, if I understand correctly, the Swiss economy is dominated by SMEs. Yes. SMEs meaning small and medium-sized businesses. CFEM focuses on energizing the small and medium business sector in emerging economies. So SME is, we know, going to be extraordinarily important to the revitalization of the Ukrainian economy. How can CFEM help? Well, thank you. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity to a medium-sized fund to intervene. Um, and um, I do it with pleasure also because we will have soon in Lugano, my native country, my native city, the possibility to continue the conversation on the recovery of Ukraine. This will be on 40 and, uh, 4th and 5th of July. Look, let me take the perspective of a medium-sized fund that focuses, as you say, is on, on medium-sized small enterprises. The first observation is that, as Maktar indicated, the IT sector is ready for investment now. I mean, we started in, Ju in, in, Ju in, uh, in January the preparation of an investment in an equity fund focusing on IT. We stopped it, it was stopped by events, but we would like to resume it as soon as possible. We think that um, Ukrainian small enterprises are exporting today IT services with success. They continue to grow during this quarter. So I, they are clearly a quick win that we should really focus on. And they would also encourage others to move in that direction. Export-oriented, medium-sized firm are probably uh, the target, the first target we should, we should look at collectively. And attract the attention on, of private capital on that. The role of a DFI is clearly to indicate to private where to go, taking first the risk. The second point is that to reach out to small and medium enterprises, we need the financial sector. I mean, it, the, the efficiency requires us to use existing financial institution, Ukrainian one. Now, for the last years, we have tried and we didn't dare, and let me be frank here, because issue of, of ownership, of transparency, of uh, policy exposed people in the financial sector made it extremely re uh, difficult to assess the risks of making credit, giving credit and resources to these institutions. I really think that this is an absolute priority if you want to reach to, again, small and medium that can fi finance their operation only through the financial sector in an effective way. And, and obviously, this is a work that we should do with the larger institutions, the larger financial institution must focus on this reform, but this is, first of all, the responsibility of the Ukrainian government. I mean, uh, transparency, clear ownership uh, uh, conditions are essential for us to move into financial institutions and reach through them re uh, uh, enterprises that need liquidity, working capital, and uh, investment means. Presence on the ground, Maktar mentioned it, um, we need the BRD and IFC to create these platforms. We cannot afford a medium-sized fund presence on the ground, but we need actual information. We need <clears throat> to coordinate what we do with, with what public and private 
oriented financial institutions are trying to do and the, the platform is something we absolutely absolutely need and let me um, raise the last point if you allow from me, from my experience in working in 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 difficult context affected by violence and 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 so on of course you are not i mean we understand the special situation which you are in but i think whatever we do we must be careful not to create tensions among community regions and so on i think we must be extremely careful to respect diversity to give equal chances to regions languages and people we must be extremely careful about fairness i mean people that receive support must be must be able to pay taxes in a transparent way must be credible we don't want to create tension between those that get support and those that don't investors enterprises and normal people that's it's a very sensitive issue i think we we must be clear about transparency and um, and finally working conditions i mean i think that qu uh, quality of work quality of jobs fairness in the way workers are treated are reintegrated women and men this also is part i think of a reconstruction effort it's not only about physical reconstruction it's also about behavior institution credibility this will induce uh, more interest and more investment i think thank you thank you dr frieden so if the four of you would be so willing I'd like to follow up on some of the issues and just give each of you any, if you'd like, an opportunity to answer. You don't have to. Um, and, and one of them, and I'm going to turn to uh, President Odile first, um, there's, there's been a couple mentions of the fact that there are institutional reforms required, there are confidence building measures required for donors, for the inst international institutions, as well as for the private sector. And that uh, we, I think the Prime Minister mentioned that there will be we all know we're going to get EU candidacy, and we will be on that path to membership that has an incredible amount of guidance in terms of these reforms. And we also know, practically speaking, that we'll be in an IMF program because we'll need the support, the macro financial support, uh, at some point when we're uh, at that right time, whenever that right moment is. So there'll be an IMF program with reforms. There will be the EU membership track, which will have its own set of reforms. President O'Deal, tell us what else, what kinds of things, in addition to those two sets that will be there, are, are, do you believe uh, we're looking for, we're, we're needing? No, first of all, I agree with you that an IMF program will be needed in order to frame and to get some macro financial support, um, and that the EU accession process can be a very, very strong anchor in driving a reform agenda at all in all levels of, of the economy and, and, and the country. We've seen that in uh, Eastern Europe, you know, we've been very much involved in all this Eastern Europe financing of the transition in Eastern European countries. And I think part of the success of countries like Poland, uh, Czech Republic and so forth is very much related to the reform agenda and the implementation of the reform for EU membership because it's, it touched upon, I mean, such a big um, part of, of the economy. What I see as crucial in and, and the key challenges we were facing before the war uh, in terms of, I mean, it's related to what was mentioned, transparency, fight against corruption, good governance um, in uh, um, public sector, public companies and so forth. And we've been very much involved in um, transforming uh, SOEs, uh, finan providing financing in relation with also deep governance reform. And I think a lot of, lot of things have been done, but there were still some where there are still some work ahead. Um, one point, because financial institutions were mentioned, I think a lot of work has been done on, I mean, and you were part of that, you know, cleaning up the financial sector, the banking sector, and so forth. And from our perspective, we've been working very closely with the banking sector um, and, and uh, using them as a tool for 
reaching SMEs and extending uh, financing, and we are still working. Their resilience in the war is, I mean, a testimony of the work that has been done to strengthen and build strong financial sector. So they also, I mean, after the war, there would probably be some work and some capital building needed and so forth. But I think that's also um, uh, an area where we can see the, what has been done in the in the last few years before the war, and uh, on which with additional support and strengthened governance also in some cases, we can build upon to, um, to finance uh, the recovery and to get, to, to I mean, bring resources to uh, the whole range of the, of the economy. So th that I would see that as a, the key priorities in terms of reform and I think indeed EU process can be very helpful in that respect. Thank you. Prime Minister, if we talk about rebuilding, we're talking about not just buildings, infrastructure, we're not talking only about capital. We're talking about, at, at the same time, you are gonna have to manage an EU membership accession process, you're gonna need to manage an IMF program, there are other reforms that are being discussed aside from that. What other objectives? What, in, what, what else do you need to put on your list of objectives? Is there, are there climate objectives? Are there other objectives that you have for Ukraine that you see as critical for this process of revitalization? Thank you so much. The first and the foremost priority is very clear. This is our victory. That comes first. And you better have no doubt that it's gonna happen. Of course, the number two priority, and today it was uh, expressed several times, in many meetings in Davos, and Mokhtar already raised this issue today. This is our key to success and the key to reform and recovery. This is the human capital. Indeed, this is a priority for our government and all of us today. We need to retain those people, make sure those internally displaced individuals and refugees come back. Uh, many people traveled all around the world, especially to the European Union. We need to make sure they're back and make sure they're willing. They are willing, but they await safer time. And with great inspiration, I'm sure, and with their encouragement, they will join this initiative to recover and rebuild Ukraine. We're deeply convinced that Ukraine will be recovered, not in just buildings and architecture, but it's going to be renewed, that was the second key word of our today's discussion, in its essence, in its core, in civil society, in rules, in the rule of law, in the right economic models, in green economy and energy. Those are our priorities. And definitely all those, th all those things are very closely linked together. And when talking about the European integration, this is one of the driving forces that Ukraine is struggling for. Ukraine pays for this with lives since 2014. This is our civilizational choice. I already mentioned that in my previous intervention. We all want to be part of the civilized world. We want to be part of the developed European family and not part of the Russian Empire or even worse, the Soviet Union. So it's not uh, a question whether it is a priority or not. This is enshrined in our constitution and this was the choice of the Ukrainian people. We are part of the European family and we're going to be part of the UK, European Union, certainly. Of course, we would need to take steps, the action plan, how we want to get there. But for us, this is not a dilemma. This is not the issue of choice. And this is not something that we need to prioritize. This is an obvious priority for the people of Ukraine. So all these things are very much interlinked today. So we need to look at this recovery, rebuilding and renovation or reconstruction project already with reference to all these key priorities. Today, some very important things were mentioned about the PPPs, the public and private partnerships, about the fair approach and e equity um, to all the regions and all the people. That's a very important ingredient in rebuilding. Without the public and private partnership, the um, financial resources of the state and of our partners will not never be enough. It is the private business in cooperation with the state that will be the right formula to create 
enabling conditions for international investment and job creation. This is just in a nutshell. I can talk about this for hours, but given we have limited time, Thank you. maybe there will be some other questions that I'm going to uh, answer to. You're absolutely right. People have an enormous amount of interest. We could talk for days, hours, days, weeks. And we probably will have to do that in the process. But I'm going to move on one more time to the issue of coordination. That might be the one single thing that I've been asked most over the last week. What does it really mean? And what is the international community thinking? Um, is there something agreed to? Is the EU map on coordination agreed to by the donors at this point? Is that how it's going to work? You spoke about coordinating between yourselves at a, at a different level. But big picture, G20 coordination on the, on the donor, on the international side. Mukhtar, can you tell us where we are in that organization? My experience is that as long as it's uh, hammered and repeated by the Ukrainian authority, it will happen. And I, Prime I have, Minister, did you hear that? You have to hammer it. Just to repeat it. Repeat it, Prime Minister, coordination, coordination, coordination. I don't want 20 processes. I don't want to, uh, uh, 20 people coming at the table with uh, 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 the operation. We saw it in many countries. Jürgen, that I've worked with uh, for many years, looking at some fragile countries and countries who were coming from war, that was one of the big problems. Because we, we, uh, people were coming, all willing to help, but the lack of coordination was a problem. Secondly, uh, avoid the temptation or use all the grant money to finance public uh, investment leverage the private sector. And it really means uh, 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 to really make some choices because it's tempting when the needs are important when you receive grant money or support to use it immediately for public expenditure. How we can have a process together and say we're carving this part to be able to, for the first loss that we will uh, uh, have to guarantee some of the losses of the private sector to crowd in private sector. I really took very good note of what the slogan of the Prime Minister, renew, renew. Renew means also thinking differently about the role of the states. Let me take about medical services. In the past, traditionally, the government will build the, the hospital, will hire all the, the medical staff, will uh, maintain, maintain it and do everything which, which cost. We can think about models whereby the private sector will be contracted to provide services health services, and the capex will be uh, supported by, by, by the private sector. The, the quality and the maintenance of these services will be done by the private sector. And where we can, by the same time, improve the quality of service, but address some of the problems of governance that uh, we had in the past. Because it will be a transparent contractual uh, mechanism between the private sector and the public sector based on services provided. And I already know that there are some ideas of people in the medical area in Ukraine who are thinking already about which type of service will be needed uh, post-war in this. And we can multiply that in, in other sectors. So thinking fundamentally about the rule of the state. There are some reforms that we have we started discussing with the government of Ukraine, and we are very advanced. So the Prime Minister mentioned PPP, and that was something that we are discussing. We are pretty advanced in the laws that need to be implemented. Natalie, you know that very well because it's, you have been involved in that process for many, many years. Uh, we were discussing about, about uh, 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 land, land reform. This is those questions that needs to be to be continued to be the privatization of state-owned banks. We work together all. All these things that were starting need to be implemented and accelerated uh, uh, now. And I think that one thing that can be done is already to put the legislative framework in place now. Take that opportunity to build the right legislative framework, decrees, law that will organize all that so that when people are looking now at Ukraine and want to invest, it, at least that thing is already done and we don't have to make it in a sequential way. Thank you so much. So there are things we can be doing now, Ukraine can be doing now. There are things that all of you can be doing now. Uh, the legislative track for the Ukrainians. And Dr. Frieden, you said that you know, you're looking at investing in, 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 into the private sector now, especially that private sector that is so resilient in exporting. What else can be done now? The, the towns of Bucha and Irpin and Hostomil have been retaken by Ukrainian authorities. The mayor of Bucha, the mayor of Melitopol was here. Um, 
these mayors and the mayor of Chernihiv, Chernihiv has come back under Ukrainian uh, control. What can be done on the rebuilding side? What can, what can we do to mobilize capital and when can we? What, what is it going to take so that we can look and talk to the mayor of Bucha and start talking about rebuilding Bucha? I'm going to leave that open to anyone and all. Dr. Frieden, you're welcome to start. Let, let me just uh, give one, one point. You know, what we have learned in difficult environment like Eastern Ukraine today is that DFI as first step of private investment and donor agencies as public must work together. This coordination is not as obvious as one may think. And I think we have to go into it together because all the external costs must be assumed by public and by donors. But this, you know, the capacity of, of DFIs to come in, identify private sector actors, take risk and support them if the environment evolves is critical. So we have to do it together, understand together the needs and take some risk if the donor, the donor that are re, they are ready to assume the externalities that an investor cannot do. So, you know, I don't think that it's about reducing risks in terms of getting subsidy when you invest in private, but in assuming the externalities that allow private to succeed. Thank you. Does anyone want to add to that, please? No, I completely agree with you that the question in the coming weeks and days will be how to start and how far we can start in the reconstruction. And this is true for municipalities. It could be also true for some key infrastructures. We've seen the railway and some questions related to that. While the war is still on, I think that we need to be able to address that. This is risky. Uh, so that's why we need to get some donor support and risk sharing framework. I don't think that we will be able to attract new foreign investors privately now. I think it's I mean, very difficult, but we can work with the private companies already in operating in Ukraine and supporting them in their activities. And I think that's something that we, we are really doing now on the I mean, regular basis, but also, I mean, supporting municipalities that um, um, uh, are need to be rebuild some key infrastructure building, uh, housing and so, and so forth. Uh, what is needed, I guess, also for the, for the municipalities that have been really, really, uh, I mean, very much destroyed is grant financing from donors because their capacity to borrow and to pay back a loan is probably, I mean, limited for, I mean, and this limits our capacity as a bank to operate. But I think that's, I mean, we need to find the right tools to support the very extreme situation. I'll, I'll speak. Hopefully the Prime Minister won't disagree. I, 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 we're hoping as much as possible of the support that the international community is going to give us is in grant form because our debt sustainability analysis, once this is over, if we're seeing, God forbid, but a 50% drop in GDP this year, we're not going to be able to have even incremental concessional loans. But again, Prime Minister, I hope you won't disagree. I, I'm going to ask whether or not anyone in the audience has any uh, questions for our panel. Konstantin uh, Magalevsky, Green Infrastructure Fund. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank BRD and IFC for continuing financing Ukrainian projects. Uh, it's, we really appreciate in such challenging time have uh, such a big uh, support. And uh, talking about the importance of uh, private sector infrastructure, BRD and IFC and uh, CFM, they are investing globally in infrastructure funds, equity and mezzanine. Uh, which role do we see in Ukraine, if any, for such funds now? Thank you. Or, basically after the victory, yeah? Thank you. I see a big role uh, for funds and private equity funds after the reconstruction. Now it's a bit, I mean, it's a challenging time, so, but we should not completely, I mean, it could be possible, but I think over time and when, when the situation, I mean, when uncertain, of course, the higher the degree of uncertainty is, the more difficult it is to, I mean, to close a fund, to raise money and so forth, because I mean, the, what we see is that a risk appetite globally in Ukraine, in part of it, but, but also in, in all the region uh, is, is um, I mean, reducing, but, uh, and that's why we can play a role as an core investor. Uh, but I think when, the le I mean, the, when uncertainty reduce and, and there is more visibility, and then I'm sure I mean, this will be a big, big uh, vector for investment in the country. Uh, hello, maybe oh. on that, I think that the conversation has already started 
and this is what is so exciting, is that optimism, and uh, we already started some conversation about private equity, what uh, some investors on the ground like you, who had some ideas, and uh, we have been a resident. Uh, and, and part of what I've said is a question that you have asked. Say, so if we want to come and visit private equity, what was the, what was the condition for us to be, to, for you to work with, with us and for us to be able to invest? And it's part of the things that I, I've said is just a, a reflection of my conversation with some of the, of the private equity uh, uh, companies. I'm going to try and take two more questions. So one here and then one here on, on okay. the left. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Andriy Nikolaenk. I'm actually the member of Ukrainian Parliament, the Tax and Financial Committee. So the legislation basis for us. Uh, there are two very short questions. One, it's an uh, issue what is really handling now by the government hardly. It's uh, the debt, the Ukrainian state debt. At the moment, uh, we have uh, almost uh, 60 billion uh, US dollars debt, and we are paying pain on time, and at the same time, we have the big problem with the budgets because our economy always, uh, already dropped more than uh, uh, half of GDP. So uh, what is your position and think and recommendation with, uh, with our debt? Should we ask the money from uh, international society and uh, still pay the debt, or maybe it's a time to start to talk about debt card? It's the first I, I, and... Uh, I, I, I think that we're going to have to take a pass and leave that one for the IMF and the government, no? Uh, uh, and then we'll yeah, and, and one, one, what's okay. very related but very important one. You mentioned that we have to finance SME. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. But uh, it's one hand is uh, position of National Bank of Ukraine. So now the biggest creditor of National Bank of Ukraine is Ukrainian banks. So we have to find a way how National Bank to stimulate Ukrainian banks to finance private sector. So from one hand, they are now asking uh, uh, private banks to finance uh, Ukrainian bonds and to support Ministry of Finance. But from other hand, uh, they demotivating them to, pr uh, to finance private sector. So this is two uh, somehow related questions. So uh, your position is also important because our government just pretty carefully listening to you. Thank you. Okay. President O'Dill and then Dr. Frieden. Uh, one comment on the debt is that the debt to International institutions need to be continue to be paid if you want international uh, institutions to be able to continue to finance. So I think that's a very important uh, element. We have I mean, to keep the preferred credit status to be able to continue to support public institutions. We need to be repaid. I think otherwise, I mean, we will have to stop. And I think that's, I mean, a very important uh, element for our continued support. And I just want to, to also add that the fact that uh, I, I, EBRD and I, uh, as a World Bank group, move very fast also is to ensure that the government has liquidity to be able to service it. So in a, in this, it's in situation a bit similar by country where, and Jürgen, I refer again to Jürgen because we've been discussing this issue so many times in our career, is that what will really happen is that we want to avoid countries to fall in areas because once you get in, into areas, the mechanisms that we have are very complex. I, it happens that I used to work for the IMF also, so I, I have an, a sense of how, the, uh, how, how it is done, and it takes a lot of time to really uh, uh, solve this issue of, uh, of debt. You know, uh, uh, We've uh, done it before. We, done we before. can do it again. So, but, it's a, but I think that we do, should not forget also the, uh, the non-performing loan, and what we are doing in the financing sector and supporting companies are very important, because if we don't sustain that support to, to companies, what we might see is an accumulation of non-performing loan uh, 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 with the banks, and that, that will have a, trick, a trickling effect on the rest of the macroeconomic situation. So we need also not to forget that, and that's something that we are working on directly now by having deferred payment of debt, by having a, every mechanism to keep uh, really uh, the bank, the company from falling into areas. Thank you. Dr. Frieden, did you want to add something? We're not going to be able to take another question. I'm sorry, because we've run out of time. But let's just make sure everyone gets their last comments in um, on these issues. Now, just two words. I mean, the, what the bank do certainly reflect macroeconomic and monetary policy. That's beyond what I can say. But I think what we can do together, donors and investors, is attribute resources from outside that must go to small and medium enterprises and make sure that the environment for them, for instance, through investment in infrastructure, can, uh, can improve. 
I mean, that's the coordination we, we should look at. Thank you. And Prime Minister, we're going to give you the last word. Thank you so much. Dear colleagues, thank you for the very topical and profound discussion. Very interesting ideas. I've, I've taken a lot of notes. I'm not going to come be coming back to all of them. But here's something I want to tell you. The Ukrainian government is coordinating our engagement with all the other, all our partners. The United 24 platform, this is the president's project that is called to actually ensure better coordination between our partners around the world. I want to thank Madam Odile and Mr. Akhtar and all the colleagues who've been speaking today and thank you for sharing very positive and very right messages and thoughts. At the very end, I'd like to say that we are now doing everything possible to maintain our macroeconomic stability under the conditions of full-fledged war. This is not an easy task. We lost around 30% of our economy we lost around 50% of our peacetime budget. And now we can only stand thanks to the support from our partners. I mean, from the standpoint of macroeconomic stability. We have always been and will continue to perform all our commitments on loans. It is very important to understand that maintaining macroeconomic stability is much easier than rebuilding trust for dozens of years when there were non-performing situations and some of the money was not repaid. So we're trying to maintain the country's macroeconomic stability. And I believe this is one of the key factors which will drive Ukraine towards very swift recovery. Because without that, it's going to take dozens of years for us to rebuild. And that must be subject of our focus and our in-depth discussions, as well as very profound work. In parallel with all the processes that we've discussed today, I want to extend my words of sincere gratitude. Thank you for your affirmative support of Ukraine, uh, your, your deep understanding of the challenges we're facing today. And thank you for the understanding that Ukraine will prevail. And in the nearest future, we're gonna be thinking about great things like recovery, development following the new technology, new models in the new environments and conditions. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for joining us today. Thank you, President Odil. Thank you, Akhtar. Thank you, Dr. Frieden, for joining us. And with this, we'll end the session, but we should not cease thinking about all the things we need to do to rebuild, restore, renew, and revitalize Ukraine. Thank you all so much. <laughs>